heard that number, I said to the lady, but I can fly to London for cheaper. She says, yes, you can fly to London for cheaper. <laughs> but that's what it is. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here because <clears throat> these two plants, although they're on different time scales, are speaking to each other. The activist communities are talking with each other. The plant operators are talking with each other. We're all looking to each other for different experiences. And so I want to share with you some observations about what I think we've learned so far from the, the San Onofre experience. I want to just say two things by way of in beginning. The first is that what I'm saying here today are my personal views and observations about this. I'm not speaking for the panel. The panel doesn't take decisions or vote or have official points of view, so I couldn't speak for the panel if I wanted to. But that's just what we were asking. Right. So, But I just want to clarify that, that <clears throat> these are my observations, and I think they're shared by some of the other folks who've been essentially involved with this, but we might all have our different level of nuance. The second thing I, I want to draw your attention to, which is obvious but worth stating, is the two plants, although while they're are paying attention to each other are in very different circumstances. And in particular, I want to draw out two very big differences. One of them is that the San Onofre plant is on Navy land, which means that a large part of the process of restoring the site um, goes through a frankly somewhat opaque mechanism in the Department of the Navy um, and where they're setting a lot of the rules. And so that's, a, that's an element of the San Onofre experience that I don't think you have here. You have other processes, uh, other processes here. Um, and another big difference is that the San Onofre plant is right in the middle of a massively populated frankly high income area where there's a huge amount of political attention to what's going on at the plant. And I can't speak for the situation here, but I will say that some of our experiences in the San Onofre Community Engagement Panel, and indeed the way the whole system was set up, reflects, um, uh, reflects that level of intense political engagement with the plant when it was operational, and intense political attention to that plant during the decommissioning phase. That may or may not happen with the same level of intensity here, and that may or may not have implications for the way a community engagement process unfolds, given the decisions that have been taken so far by PG&E and others, and how those, might, those decisions might evolve. I have many fewer slides. <laughs> I have 11, of which this is the first one. So what I thought I would do today is talk about my impressions and welcome you to interrupt me along the way um, so we can have a conversation, because the slides are structured in a way that it's less me talking at you and more framing some issues that I think are worth uh, thinking about. Thank you. Um, so the first one, I want to say a couple things by way of demography about the panel. Um, we are an 18-member panel. We are all volunteers, so uh, an in infinite rise in our salary will still be zero. Um, we are mostly public officials, plus uh, NGOs, labor, business, environmental, uh, and one representative from Native American communities. Um, nobody applied for these positions. Uh, instead, we were selected by Edison and selected by Edison in consultation with a number of other stakeholders, including the folks that became the leadership of the CEP, myself as a chairman. So I didn't apply. I didn't actually know that the job was available, the volunteer job was available. I got a call from Edison saying, we've seen you working in other kinds of settings where technical content matters, but politics also matters, and we'd like you to help us do this here. Um, and I said to Ted Craver, CEO of Edison at the time, sure, how hard could this be? And that might have been um, one of my worst political judgments in history. It's been very, very interesting, but it has not been easy. We have quarterly meetings. We have workshops on technical topics where those ar topics arise. Per Peterson spoke at one of them as we were getting ready as Edison was getting ready for the decisions around the procurement of the canisters for the spent fuel uh, storage, the, the, the canisters beyond the 55 canisters that were already on site. We have typically at every quarterly meeting an expert presentation or two. <clears throat> we're not a formal decision-making body. We have no official government oversight function. I spent a lot of time looking at this when I first agreed to, to, to take on this responsibility. It struck me, and I think struck Edison and a lot of other people, that there are many layers of official oversight responsibility on the fiscal side, on the safety side, and on and on and on, and that another layer of official oversight actually would be less helpful yeah, than a mechanism 
system to provide a conduit, a two-way conduit between the operator of the facility, Edison, and their co-owners, but it's really mainly Edison, so Southern California Edison, and the communities in plural that are affected by the decommissioning process. And certainly something that I've emphasized from day one is that conduit's got to be a two-way conduit. This is in part to help the communities understand what's going to be happening with decommissioning. So the slides you saw earlier from Tom Jones about the timelines, we have our own versions of those. Every time they get harder to read, so I urge you to find the simpler versions <laughs> early and often um, because people until the panel existed really didn't understand what the timetable was going to be for this. And so and that's totally understandable. I, I, I will say that one of the things that I'm I, I sit on the advisory board for INPO, which is the organization that oversees the commercial safety of all the U.S. reactor fleets. I sit on the board, now advisory board, of Electric Power Research Institute. I spend a lot of my time with technical people and people in companies that are engaging in these kinds of activities. Um, but I'm a political scientist by training. And one of the things that I've really been struck by in this process is that people, especially folks with engineering backgrounds, have a tendency to view the public as just uninformed, and all we need to do is speak more or more loudly or with more paper or ideally more PowerPoint slides about what people need to know and do. And I totally understand that sentiment, and that sentiment is a recipe for failure because the other direction of this conduit often doesn't function in these processes. There's a maybe especially in the nuclear power industry, a, a sense that kind of we know what the risk is, we in the industri industrial sense know what the risks are and so on, and these other folks just kind of need to learn. And there's a, there's a failure to appreciate the way different members of the public are thinking about risks, thinking about what's going on and so on. And I have learned a tremendous amount, I believe Edison has learned a tremendous amount by making sure that the other direction of this conduit works, that this is a mechanism for the operator to learn more about what the different communities really care about. And I'll give you some examples of that in just, uh, in, in, in just a second. In my view, that has been aided enormously by two things. That, that was one of the things that was so interesting about it's a mic microphone. I went the wrong direction. That was one of the things that was so interesting about one of Tom King's slides, which was the list of things that got commented on by members of the public when they went out and asked for expressions of interest. And of course, we saw security got zero and safety got five. And it was, it was just a whole list of other things that this committee really would not believe people could possibly care about because our mandate is safety and everybody must care about what we care about. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked. So, so I guess I would say that there is, it's interesting in the history of cognitive psychology in this area, there's been a growing effort to understand systematically why people's perceptions vary and so on. And I don't want to go down a wormhole of the academic work in this area, but I will simply say, make the observation that that is the case. And I believe that is one of the major values of, of this panel, the way it's structured. Let me just say that there are two aspects of this panel that I think make that function work well. One of them is precisely, precisely that we are not a formal decision-making body, which means that we don't get wrapped around the pro procedural stuff of making formal decisions and everybody jockeying around those positions. And so it liberates the panel to, to investigate a lot of things, to talk about a lot of things that would be harder to do in a formal decision-making body. The other thing um, is that most of the panel members are elected officials. As a professional political scientist, I have learned more about politics from this process than anything else I've done in my career, and it's mainly because of this systematic engagement of local elected officials, because they are in the business on a constant basis of weighing costs and benefits and different interests and so on in the community that's worried about lots of other things at the same time. And so a panel that doesn't have that systematic input is a panel that has a hard harder time, in my view, staying tethered to what the community really cares about uh, and how it's weighing those those concerns against other things that are omnipresent in the political decision-making process. So I, I think that's actually been a very important part of our process. It might be that that's more important in San Onofre because of the political intensity of the discussions in San Onofre compared with here. I don't know, but I'll simply report that as an observation. Um, how, how long is it, has your panel been in existence? Since 2000, beginning of 2014, I believe. Yeah, so it's, um, it's coming up to four years. 
Um, and of course, the one here has just begun. Uh, could you talk either now or along the way as you're uh, giving your other remarks about any evolutions in the in the interactions or the way or the way things have changed uh, since the first few months until here you are uh, mature four years later? Coming I'll up make a few years. comments about that. Thank along, you. Along Thank the way. you. Yeah. Other questions the, for him? The, the other the other thing is uh, this this observation that that uh, significant participation by elected local, I presume mainly elected local officials, or is it also? Well, there are also, for example, the from the first responder community, people responsible for the state parks. Uh, there's a representative from Camp Pendleton, which is the marine base okay. yeah, that is on Navy land that also is adjacent to the plant. Um, the sheriff's, uh, Orange County Sheriff. Uh, okay. Because the, the thing that I find really interesting is is how that, that structure and in, in, in having that kind of membership uh, essentially uh, brings uh, results in representation of public interest and 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 whether it's a credible representation the the idea that elected officials are playing a significant role in a process actually is really comforting to me simply because that is the purpose of representative democracy is for people to collectively identify individuals who will they trust to represent their interests the opinions of those people is quite important, I think. So that, that's my view precisely. When the panel was first set up, nobody knew what the animal was. And so Edison went out to the local sure. town councils and so on and, and asked for people to join. And then what's happened since then is that membership on this committee in some of the cities and towns around the plant has become a focal point. And there's actually been intense debate in some of the cities and towns about who's going to be on the panel and some changes in that regard and I won't go into the politics of that but it to me is evidence that the panel's delivering value in the sense of it's revealing information about what's happening at the plant and helping the plant operators make decisions that are better informed uh, I, without really knowing I have this quick observation that 18 looks like a big number for it, the membership it is, but in, look, this is like a corporate governance point. A any board above seven is unmanageable. And so um, once you get to a larger group, then, then no, this is a very important point about organizational behavior. Once you get to a larger group, then you have some folks who spend more time and other folks who spend less time. You needed an executive committee. We don't really call it an executive committee. You kind of need some procedures. But um, a smaller group would necessarily require removing voices yeah, from the communities, so I, I see this as the right size for the footprint of the plant. Now, this, Dr. Victor, does the panel make recommendation that's binding on the licensee, no, or is no, this they advisory? Can't. They're all advisory. It's the all panel advisory. can't even say we agree as a panel to that that Edison or somebody should do X. What we can do, we have done now several times, more than several times, is the leadership of the panel can get a sense of the discussion, and then write, make some recommendations or some observations as, as leadership of the panel. For example, we've written to the California Energy Commission, we've had some visits from the California Energy Commission around this issue of consolidated storage. We, we believe that, that uh, this is the idea of interim storage, so mm -hmm. these facilities in New Mexico and Texas and hopefully other places that would be interim alternative to Yucca if and when Yucca never happens and other alternatives for permanent repositories don't pan out, that we're all victims of that failure to deliver on the promise um, of, of a permanent repository. And so by accelerating the changes in federal law towards interim storage, we can accelerate the date way before 2068 by, at which spent fuel is removed from these facilities. We have that interest in San Onofre, you have that interest here, and we have, among, along with a lot of other folks, built helped build up some other political support for this that would ultimately need to be expressed in the form of the change. Now, what are your obligations and duties as the panel's chairman? Um, to keep a pulse, um, to help, to work with Edison, to manage, um, uh, the agendas for the meetings, to help identify topics for future meetings, to identify 
areas where there's public concern about something and we don't quite know how to structure that and then to go out and have a whole set of consultations with members of the public about that. For example, we're in the process right now of scoping out some workshops probably, workshop or workshops on extreme events. So way beyond design basis, potential events that could affect an ISFACY only site. Um, terrorist attack, for example. Um, and to collect the scientific information about those events, potential remediation of those events, and have a, have a discussion in a non-classified format about what, what really could go wrong and what the consequences would be and what the remediation would be. That's something there's a lot of people in the public who are concerned about that. In fact, there's been a petition. Um, uh, to have us talk more about this. And so part of what I've done as chairman is spend a lot of time, that's an example of a topic where I've spent a huge amount of time, as have many other people, to try and frame that up. We, we did, um, and I, you may have copies of it, or we can easily get you copies of it, when, when Edison was about to make the decisions around the stainless steel canisters, there's been some pushback against the idea of using stainless steel canisters. I, I, I'm not persuaded at all by the pushback being technically grounded, but, but be that as it may, we organized a set of expert workshops. Pear was involved with one, a whole bunch of literature reviews, and I drafted on behalf of the panel a white paper about the options and about what they mean strategically, got it peer reviewed. We op opened that entire process. So that was a very, very time consuming example of something that I do as chairman. And all of this is done on a pro bono basis? Yes. Uh huh. Um, you, you may be wondering about my cost benefit calculation, which might be distorted, but I, frankly, I believe that I believe that if we help establish a model, well, not the only model, but a model for how community engagement is done in the decommissioning process, and if we help build the support needed for interim storage, which is a huge deal for decomm decommissioned plants, that that'll be a massive public good, yeah. not only for the local communities, but for California and the country, and that's why I'm doing it. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a couple questions about the Composition. By the way, I'm only through slide three, so I'm no apologies. Yeah, I'm in your hands is the you're allowed to say, You're allowed to say that's on slide seven, and then you can <laughs> answer the question later. Um, are any members of these 18 uh, engineers scientists? Yes, and, yes. Uh, it's varied. The group, for the most part, is not technically. Yeah, anchored, which what you'd expect, which sure. is good. Um, but we have a couple members who really know the industry. Um, and for a while, we had a member who had who was trained in physics. Um, well, Ted uh, Quinn is on your panel, and of course, right, he so was Ted, the president of the ANS, right, and he certainly so knows Ted the industry. Is, sure. Ted has been enormously but, helpful. But this, it, yeah. So, so, so you have you have at least some way to tap. Yes. Other, okay. But okay. but we we tap in addition to that to, to folks like Ted who are just invaluable. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of help from Steve Maharis, among okay, others at sure. um, I reach out all the time to people in the, new, in the NRC. The NRC staff have been enormously helpful, you, even in the face of some extraordinary challenges where they're just getting bombarded by, by uninformed emails and harassment, frankly. Um, and they've been quite gracious. Do, do you have, if a technical question arises, do you have the ability to reach out to anybody to get that question answered? Can you hire consultants or any? Uh, we haven't had to hire consultants. Um, it's hard to see that arising in exactly that way because almost everything we look at is strategic in nature. So it's usually. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. I was just asking. The, the, the reason I asked that is that the panel here is new, but we've already communicated with that panel that because. Song's never had a panel like this, and so that's unfortunate. But here we are. That if it's, we're a safety committee, if if questions about safety or issues about safety arise that that panel is is concerned or interested about, we've reached out to them and say if they'll ask us, we'll do what we can to answer because that's that would be part of we interpret our, our general charter as doing that too, and that that that's a a function which is available to that panel uh, over the years. And you don't have anything like that quite? No, we really do this on an ad hoc basis. The San Onofre currently has an expert panel that's been set up under a settlement related to a lawsuit at the Coastal Commission. Yeah, I, I know about that, but, and but, but that, that, that wouldn't be quite the same. Please describe it. Yeah. So, sorry, I just I want to finish go the ahead, thought. Go ahead, go sure. ahead. Um, so there is that panel as an example. Um, and I have, with the chair of that panel and with Edison, um, help set up some questions we want to be able to ask. Oh, okay, so that's about. helpful. 
in particular about extreme events because, yep. you know, when, if we... Sure, no, that's helpful. Right, so when we have this workshop on extreme events, um, the, it is very easy. Our mission is to open this two-way conduit and keep it open. I believe we fail in our mission if we end up having public meetings that are focused on things that are not technically grounded. And so I have personally spent a huge amount of time getting versed in the te technical issues here. And this is an example where being able to go to an expert committee and say, here's a list of 10 things that people say they're worried about, from asteroid impacts to terrorist attack, help us understand what is really in the realm of plausibility and what's not so that we can have a conversation in the public's eye focused on things that are real or not real. So that's an example of something where we don't need to go off and, and hire consultants in some sense, but we do need to have the capacity to tap some technical expertise to give us some judgment, technically informed judgment. Yeah, I would have thought that even the most obvious thing is you or the public asking you have a question. And somebody needs to be there that says, oh, there are four reports on that that have been written over the years. Here, look at them. Yeah, so we I mean, all, just being able to find that is. Right, so we do all of that. Um, yeah, yeah, but but I, the, my my reaction is that the local panel here needs that too, and if it's safety, they've got us to ask. There are other things that aren't safety that they can't ask us. I was ju I was just asking. Yeah. So so there are two ways that we mostly get that information. One is that we have people on the panel who, like Ted, who are knowledgeable about the industry and technically very knowledgeable, and either directly or with a phone call or two can reach out That's and get that kind one, of information. One phone call finds it out. And, and, and the other is um, Edison is at every single one of our meetings and is this is their panel, and they have a stake in this working. And so many, many technical questions we put back to Edison, and we get a technical brief from them or something like that. Um, let me just say, um, next slide, not much to say here. This is an action photo of one of our meetings. There's the action. Um, the uh, typical meetings include an update uh, on the timeline for the decommissioning process, an expert presentation, as I mentioned. I want to just say one or two things about what we typically do in these meetings and what's working, what's not working. We have a public comment period, which is at the end. It's an hour, at least, usually longer than an hour. Um, we used to have a public comment period, which was a little more interspersed and a little more back and forth, where a question would be asked and would be answered on the spot. That became acrimonious at times, partly because of the larger political context here. And so we've more formalized our public comment period. It looks a little bit more like city council meetings, uh, where we don't link public comment to particular agenda items, but we just do it all at the end, and then we try and answer some of those questions on the spot. We're in the process right now of trying to figure out a better way to be more responsive to the public on the spot. We don't have a magical solution to that, but you're going to see us over the next two or three meetings experiment with some different um, I ideas about that. It is enormously helpful for us to be able to have an expert at, uh, or someone who's an expert in the domain that we're talking about at, at each meeting. So for example, <coughs> a year and a half ago, um, we devoted one and ultimately two meetings to the question of the seismic risk uh, in the Southern California coast. Um, when uh, Songs was an operating plant, it had agreed to fund a new analysis of the original Chevron seismic that had been shot offshore and to, to shoot some new uh, 3D seismic, I guess a de facto 4D. Um, and we brought in the guy who led that team, gave a phenomenal briefing. We then organized a series of other briefings at city councils who were just generally interested in what the seismic risks are and so on. Um, there were some members of the public and some local pressure groups that decided to to mischaracterize that, so we then sat down and had actual expert meetings with them to walk them through how one does seismic analysis. So a huge amount of time is spent on that that we could not have done without being able to bring in this expert. And he was involved with this because Edison had backed a very large study that had done a new, fresh analysis of the seismic risk in Southern California. So that typically one or two things like that every year, which are expert uh, expert driven. Um, any questions on this slide here? At some point, I'll show you the action there. Um, I want to say something about the surprise. There's a picture on the left of the site today. There's a picture on the right of a kind of composite of what the site will look like in the future. Um, I really applaud the comments earlier about not going to SafeStore. Um, 
that was not an option ever here. <laughs> People are going to decommission the plant, they can decommission it as quickly as possible. That's not really a financial decision. That is, when the, when the original deal with the community ends, that the plant's <coughs> providing power and jobs and so on, the plant needs to be removed, and that's the kind of essence of the deal that's being um, um, developed right now. I believe it's going to be a very, very important moment when the domes come down. There's just some really interesting engineering going on about how you bring down the domes. Um, but I will say that there's one big surprise that I, as someone who's been following this issue reasonably closely and then watched through the community engagement panel, I was a little astonished the extent to which the communities are surprised that the spent fuel stays there. And so I don't know if that's already understood widely in the community here, but it certainly was not understood widely in the communities around the San Onofre plant. And so that's a big deal and something that's really worth underscoring because um, if we have some strategy for removing the fuel from the ISFC and then removing the ISFC, then you completely change the timelines that were presented earlier. And people are really upset, and I could totally understand it, they're upset that the plant is shut and the spent fuel is still there. And it is not the kind of upset that is amenable to a risk-benefit calculation because I think most people trained in this area say, well, the risks there are essentially zero. Why are we concerned about this? It has to do with the idea that there is all the fuel still left in the community and people want it out. That is, we have spent a huge amount of time on that question. One meeting every year, if not more, is on this issue of what management and stewardship looks like for the SFC, what the aging management program is, or what we call defense in depth, what the interim storage arrangements might be, how do we accelerate those, and so on. Is that um, because there's other communities that have greenfielded sites with dry casks sitting on them, and my understanding is that 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 those concerns don't really persist post activity because literally it just doesn't show up any place in the public consciousness. It's not visible. It's not in the news. It's just not. A very, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have that same yeah. visceral daily impact as it does during the process when you're trying to figure out what to do and how to execute the decommissioning. Is that maybe um, my hunch is that the experience we've seen in other plants is like Maine Yankee. Mm -hmm. I love Maine, but there are not a lot of people there. Um, Fair enough. Zion. Mm -hmm. uh, I visited how about um, Yankee Row. Well, but, but I guess the point is that the, the data points we have for these other facilities where once decommissioning is over, there's not a lot of ongoing attention to the ISFC, those data points come from, from, from places that are fairly rural. rural and have not had the level of intense concern. I, I believe, my own view is that because of the concerns and attention we've seen at San Onofre, you are going to see a lot more attention yeah. and concern in decommissioning than you would expect because of the kind of general public um, awareness of these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. I visited uh, with um, the vice chairman of the community engagement panel a year or so ago, I guess two years ago, um, I can't actually remember, but a year or two ago, uh, Zion, north of Chicago. Uh, we met with the, their community engagement panel. One guy showed up. Uh, they'd had a few meetings. Nobody came. <coughs> End of story. This is totally different in California. So I, I really think you, we need to pay close attention to this issue of the stewardship of the relationship with the public and the change in the expectations of the deal, frankly, with the public when the plant is shut down. And that's what we're observing with this kind of surprise, if you like, ar around the ongoing presence of the, uh, of the ISFC. Uh, I made a list here. You guys have the slides, and so I won't go through all of them, of the kinds of concerns that the public has had. I did not put safety first when I saw the earlier slides today, but I'm happy that it's there. Um, we've actually seen a lot of concern about safety. Uh, and we've seen that concern because public trust in institutions is low, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. And so the default position is that it's just expected that people in this industry do things in a safe way. Say that again? The, the default position is just expected that people in this industry do things in a safe way. It is expected that NRC Overseas effectively, it is expected that the utilities does do things safely. Be partly because of the way San Onofre shut around the steam generator um, uh, issues, and partly because of 
I think, frankly, broader loss of public trust in institutions, we've seen a lot more concerns about safety. So this issue, for example, of the seismic risks that I mentioned earlier, we spent a lot of time on that question. And then what does it mean for peak ground acceleration at the plant? What does it mean, therefore, for design of the ISFACI, the, the whole tech system that, that uh, San Onofre has, has a upgraded seismic design for reasons similar to what you have here in Diablo Canyon. So the peak ground acceleration is, is higher than in a typical um, you know, underground uh, uh, cask system that whole tech would have someplace else. Um, but lots of people not trusting the numbers, and so wanting to see how do they, how does this all work out? And I understand that, but we've seen actually huge attention to safety. It makes me think that if the public is asked right now, what are the things you're worried about with decommissioning at Diablo? I would not believe most of what the public self-reports as their concerns, because those concerns will evolve as the decommissioning process uh, gets going. And so I would just be cautious that there might be some error bars on the self-reported concerns that people have about the decommissioning uh, process. Well, the, then, of course, very different period in history. But if you look at Rancho Seco, you know, it just sort of evaporated away. I, the, <laughs> that might and, happen. And it's still sitting there. The, the old st We saw the photos yesterday of these old structures. There's a dry storage. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the just, spent fuel's just sitting it's a there. Different place. Yeah. It's, it's just a comp I, I think you may have pointed towards something also, which is that the way in which the San Onofre plant shut down and got decommissioned due to major equipment failure certainly changes the way one would look at that. I, I think so, but but I do think that the attention to um, site operations mm -hmm. and site stewardship at decommissioned nuclear plants from this moment, or actually from the last five or six years forward, will be a different world from the Rancho Seco world. That's my sense. <laughs> that but makes that's, sense. that's a political observation, not a not a technical observation. I think that's actually been. Some of the challenge of this whole process has been that there are easy technical answers to many questions that are frankly just politically not relevant. And, and that's um, what we're seeing, for example, in the ongoing public concern about Fair this. Um, I won't go through all of these here. I will say um, I want to flag two. One is this issue of preparedness for the first responders. The previous presentation talked about how this is being handled here. Yeah. This emerged through the community engagement panel as an issue because of the shrinking footprint. Uh, so that from a risk point of view, the footprint shrinks. From a uh, glide path for the first responder community, it doesn't shrink as quickly as the risk footprint shrinks. And so there's a mismatch. And that's resulted yeah. in an ongoing relationship sure. that I think has been very important that was really first flagged through this two-way conduit. <clears throat> so maybe that problem is addressed now here through the CPUC actions that were discussed earlier. Um, maybe not. But that's an example of an area where something that nobody really thought it much in detail about when the decommissioning decisions were taken, and then you look at the NRC rules and expectations and best practices, has been different in practice that, in, in a way that the operator would not have understood. Yeah, well. I just want to also flag jobs. We have organized labor on our panel. And while jobs have received much less attention than the safety issues, the stewardship of the ISFACI, and so on, um, they, they are a significant part of the concern around the plant. And they, in, in our plant, are quite differential because the people who work at the plant, for the most part, don't live in the community right next to the plant, because it's really, really expensive. And they live in other communities. And so we've found that there are different communities have different interests depending on the different problems that they're engaged with. And that's why it's so important to have multiple communities represented on something like a panel such as this. Um, so those are the kinds of concerns that we've uh, addressed. We spend more time on the issue of ISFACI stewardship and, um, and aging management than on anything, uh, any other single uh, topic. The, I don't know what happened there. I just we're on a slide called exactly. Thank you very much. Um, this has been our main focus right now: is to think about uh, what defense in depth looks like for an ISFACI only site. We are not at an ISFACI only site yet, and it'll take longer to get there because of something that's happened fairly recently. I'll talk a little bit about in just a moment. <coughs> 
research. What does monitoring look like? What does inspection of canisters look like? Test canisters, so the, the, there's a uh, one or two canisters that will be kept in the coldest location for stress corrosion cracking reasons. Dealing with potential worst case scenarios that I mentioned, uh, that, that I mentioned uh, er, earlier. I think this is a really important deal. Um, and I think it is an area where the industry has not, and NEI, for example, has not been really prepared to talk with the public in English. They've been prepared to talk with the public in math, but not in English. And we have spent a huge amount of time almost translating the technical documents into plain English and talking about them in plain English terms so that people can understand what the Defense in Depth program really would look like here. I, let me just flag one thing that I think um, has a high comfort level in the industry and a very low comfort level in the public, which is that many of the technologies you need to do serious long-term aging management don't exist right now. So for example, high-res uh, rings for, for uh, inspecting the entirety, 100% of the canister surface. Those exist in principle right now, but are not widely used. Um, and people in the industry have no problem with that because they say, you know, as the technology is needed, it'll be developed. As the robotics are needed, it'll be, they'll be developed. We had a briefing at one of our meetings from EPRI, which is doing a lot of work in this area, and the San Onofre plant has remained inside the decommissioning part of the EPRI program, even as they've left the operational part of the EPRI program. And so they, the EPRI briefing talked about robotics and so on, and it was cool. And I, and I said, well, that's interesting to see all the technology being developed, and I think most people who are technically trained had that impression. And most people who weren't technically trained had the impression, this stuff's not ready, yeah. what are we doing? Sure. Mm -hmm. And so I just would, would be very, very attentive to that, because when we have those briefings now, we explicitly include discussion of what are the timetables along which we would expect this, uh -huh. this technical capability so, to be developed. So, so something related to that is this, this issue of canister cracking, and one of the things that makes me a bit disappointed was that in licensing the canisters, they never analyzed the consequence of having a, you know, a tight aperture crack, and they licensed them to be perfect instead of allowing for defects. And the if you if you had taken if you had taken the approach of of allowing for those imperfections, analyzed it, showed what the consequence is. You'd be in a very different place, different place today. So you're you're also pointing towards in designing for inspectability yeah. and having that available up front because people won't trust you that you can that you're going to have it available when you need it. Is there is there like a list of things that you could do better if you were based on your insights around sort of canisters and and getting getting it right the first time so you don't have to go back and fix things? Yeah. So my my read of the technical literature in the process right now is that canister design is actually doing okay, or more than okay. It's actually a very robust solution to the problem, which is to get it out of spent fuels into canisters, dried, helium overpressure, um, minimal water content. The kind of list of technical things one needs to do um, is long but not unmanageable. Um, but then along the way, things happen. So we've had an incident with, um, I'll talk about one in just a second, but we had an incident with the shim design for the Holtec canisters. So then, you know, this happens and the technical people are very comfortable with the response because a minimum number of these pins are bent or broken and so they can do the flux calculations and everybody's comfortable with the capacity of the canister to reject heat. And that, what I, the language that I just used there is language that people in the technical community are totally comfortable with. The public doesn't, A, understand the paragraph that I just spoke, and B, looks at this thing and says, what's going on with the bent shims in the first place, or the bent pins in the first place? And so this is, this is part of this concern that there's always something going wrong with the technology. Um, but So I, I think actually, um, it's certainly an area where I'm spending a lot of time now, is we, we the community engagement panel, and Edison, the operator, need to do a better job of articulating exactly what all the layers of defense are and why this multi-layered defense process makes the canister system more robust. Well, I'm fascinated actually that, that the, the trust and confidence has been degraded to that point because there's an important analogy with, say, operation of complex technologies, be it airplanes or nuclear power plants or, or rockets or whatever, but 
but that, um, so that one of the fundamental tenets of safety culture is that nothing's perfect, and so you're constantly searching for finding, identifying if it's a self-revealing problem like a bent pin or something, you consider that to be more serious than things that have been discovered, but you know that you're in this constant mode of identifying problems. You have formal processes, corrective action programs, and the absolute worst thing that can happen to destroy safety culture is to start treating minor problems as being things that merit severe punishment because instead what you do is you drive a culture of, of concealing things and it's self-reinforcing. The Department of Energy has got, its back, got itself backed into that corner multiple times and it just gets worse and worse and worse as opposed to saying, you know, we, we, need, we need everybody to be on, on board with the idea that that the way that we manage problems is to identify them at low levels of significance, get them fixed, and then move forward and encourage a culture of reporting those problems. So, Agreed. Um, but I just say that that mindset, which is the mindset of someone who has a career in operating high-risk technologies mm -hmm. effectively. There are people who operate high-risk technologies badly. That's not the mindset. But the kind of the, what's called in the industry the, the nuclear safety culture, and the same thing exists on aircraft carriers for aircraft uh, operations and you know, a variety of other areas. Commercial where, airplanes, commercial which we airplanes. just flew here on. Yes, so, <laughs> so that's, but that's, that's not the way the public, when they're observing this, comes to the issue because the public is not looking at the whole data set. They're Correct. looking at what shows up in the news as, gee whiz, there's some problem there, these clowns are at mm -hmm. it again, and why is it that this problem keeps, keeps happening mm -hmm. and not recognizing that this is a little right. more, but, but more the, like basketball where you're... But the, this, this, this is where elected officials and government and regulators need to be competent because because once you get back into this corner there's enormous damage to public welfare from from because you get backed into doing things your your technology systematically becomes less safe because you're covering things up and and when when that happens it's the responsibility of governance and regulators to to get things fixed and when they don't then then we we run into really serious problems uh, with respect to to very suboptimal types so, of behaviors. So I agree completely with that. What I've observed so far is that there's been no backing into that corner at the San Onofre site. Okay. Instead, what's happened is that people are now bending over backwards to talk more about things because no, people want to make sure there's more transparency around everything so, so, so that it never looks like there's some piece of data being withheld. So, so I'm reasonably confident could, about that. And I'll show you a, a test case that's you know, now. Actually, so I, was, so I was just going to say, you're exactly right. The, so, the, the solution to that is for the operator, the owner, the, everybody to just be transparent and take the bullets and punches and other things and just be honest about what's going on. Whether you can dig out of this hole is still a question, but that's the, I, that's the only solution I can think of that will ever work. Yeah, it, it's a very, very hard thing for an operator to do. I have to say that I, I've been very impressed. We've had our differences. I've had my differences with Edison on a few things, including the settlement for the Coastal Commission suit and so on. But um, I've been very impressed at how they have that message completely internalized. Bob, sorry, you've been very patient. You wanted to say something? No, it's okay. I, I had something along those lines about trust. Uh, and your panel... It's been four years, and so you've had plenty of opportunity to explore what sort of trust different sectors of the public have in different kinds of institutions. And what I want to ask is about any significant distrust in your panel. Yeah, I'll talk more about that in a second. Oh, oh so you'll come to that. Yeah. I, mean, the, yeah, I'm gonna, I think it's going to be in two slides. Okay, no, no, it's okay. We still got plenty of time. I, I just wanted, I just want to make a comment about something you said mm -hmm. that we touched on about. Gee, 15 minutes ago. One of the differences between, this, between Rancho Seco and Ed Edison and PG&E and the sites, and, and Rancho Seco, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, whatever its flaws are or were, nobody in the public ever accused them of doing something adverse to the public interest because of profit. 
it's a municipal utility district. They don't make profit. And that aspect is different for PG&E, and it's certainly different for Edison, where at least some of the public are, and I'm not arguing, just reporting, coming back all the time to a profit-making company trying to figure out how to maximize profit. Uh, and so quite separate from SMUD being out there, it's not, there's, this, there's, not, there's not a million people right near the site or something like that. that that's an important difference uh, yeah. to, at, at, between you and Edison or our local panel and PG&E. But um, you could imagine some people, or I guess you're going to come to it, so I'll, I'll let you come to it. Some people saying, oh, but this was appointed by and it's paid for by Edison. Uh, go on. You, you'll yeah, so come so I just want to... That is a difference in perception. Yeah, but of yeah. course, everybody knows it's a that all these de decommissioning activities are trust funded pass throughs where the non spent know, balances know, get no, refunded. But, it, but these perceptions are important. No, 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 but this is very, very important because that was not understood. I watched these, not watched, I was sitting there taking hits left, right, and center at these meetings from day one. And I watched that some of the hits are directed at this view that folks are cutting corners to save money. Example, our equivalent to your breakwater are the ocean conduits. Yeah, Three course. or four hundred million dollars to remove them. It's the analog. Big right? ecological um, consequences, adverse mostly, of removing them. And so it seems likely to me that the outcome is going to be to leave the conduits in place and do you know, reef restoration and things like that and so on, and then have some refund to the extent the law allows back into ecological benefits so that everybody's better off for that. Um, when we first started talking about that, it was very important that everybody understand and that Edison in particular underscore that this is not their money. This is the public's money. And so on a regular basis, you'll see that in our briefings, the discussion of where the funds are coming from. Not because we have oversight over that, but because it's part of breaking down this perception that decisions are being made for profit-driven motive, when in reality, of course, during decommissioning, it's totally different, or during, frankly, okay. any regulated operation is totally different. I want to talk just briefly about uh, a you test case. Into the mic, especially when you're talking well. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, should I say the sentence again? Well, yeah. Lift the mic up a little bit. Okay. It's, it's Sorry, funny. the mic is its like wearing an oxygen mask more than a microphone. I have to say that, that we've slipped on something that we had shifted to, which was to set the speaker up. And this is, this is a, our video folks. Set the speaker up where they're standing in a position where both the audience and the committee well, okay. can see their okay. face. We're Go not going to fix it this morning. But that would also help a lot with being able to be heard. So we'll do that again in the future, okay. right? Good. Okay, okay. thanks. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> expect the unexpected. Um, on a regular basis, things happen. Um, just like they happen on an aircraft carrier during carrier operations, and they happen at nuclear plants. You should know. We, we of course, know about this event. Right. We're going to describe it to the public. Yeah. So, well, the public knows. Like yeah, everybody. But our, our public may not. Go ahead. Okay, well. My guess is your public knows about it because this has been in the press a lot. Um, early August, during the canister lowering um, of a canister that had been removed, of spent fuel removed from the pools, moved to the SFC, the canister is lowered. It's lowered down 18 feet or so. There are rings along the way that are part of the design of the Holtec system. Sure. And the canister got jammed on one of the rings. And the crane operator did not know that the canister was not going down uh, and kept lowering the rigging. And so therefore... And it, and it was jammed, so it wasn't going anywhere. Right, but it wasn't going anywhere at that moment. Yeah. Kept lowering the rigging. After a period of time, it was discovered that... Um, the canister was not going down, even though the rigging was going slack. And that was discovered actually by the Edison people who were doing oversight of this process because the, um, the, the canister offloading is being done by subcontractors to Holtec. This is actually something the public has now learned a lot about, is that it's not just the Edison employees who are doing stuff. And so, frankly, you have a relationship not just with the company that's operating, but also with the subs. And so we have spent a lot of time putting the subs in front of the public and helping them understand how, to, how, how important it is to engage with the public. We are about to do that with the general contractor for the facility. I would urge you to do the same thing here early so that people understand 
who the, who the contractors are, but also the contractors understand the importance of public engagement because for most contractors, this is alien territory. Um, the event was reported to the NRC, um, but was reported as a safety issue, uh, work, potential worker safety issue, and not as a nuclear critical issue. Um, I think it became more dramatic when, when a worker at the site, who was part of one of the subcontractors, gave a presentation that he said um, he, he promised his daughter he would give this presentation and talked about the incident there and portrayed the incident as a near miss. It may or may not be a near miss. There's a variety of views about this. The NRC has just put out a, pre a preliminary letter, not really a report. And so there's a lot of work going on about this. The moment this happened, Edison stopped the offloading campaign. And the moment this happened at our community engagement panel meeting, the public also started focusing a lot more on these issues, which is totally understandable. And it's part of this drumbeat of concern. Um, the offloading campaign is still stopped. They are in the process of redesigning and rehearsing a new program that involves real-time video coverage of the canister lowering, lowering so that you don't have to just rely on radiation measurements, but you can rely on actually visually seeing the canister going down, retraining of the subs. The NRC is finishing its inspection and its report. There's a lot of other detail there that I could talk about, but frankly, the people at Edison would be better to talk about. Um, I believe this is an important test case because <clears throat> this is an example where the reaction from Edison and from our panel and others has been, let's make everything really, really transparent here. So that means uh, uh, stopping the process. That means making the retraining program as transparent as possible. Um, that means a commitment that our panel has asked for and Edison has absolutely uh, uh, reaffirmed, which is that they will come back to the public and talk about what happened. In one of our special meetings, we'll set up a town hall, a community engagement panel town hall. They will talk about what happened, what the remedial actions are. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission will have its own process. I spoke with them earlier this week, and we will invite them to our town hall, and hopefully they'll come, uh, to talk about what they learned in this process. And um, I think it's a very important example where the unexpected happens, and then the public wants to see that you're taking it seriously, or the operator is taking it seriously, and what the remedial actions are, and so on. I want to just say, currently, this is where the San Onofre site is right now. It's temporarily suspended. Uh, the rest of the slide is stuff that I've already uh, uh, talked about. It'll delay the offloading campaign by a bit, unless more things are discovered, and then it'll delay it further. It's not like everybody's rushing to send their spent fuel to some repository that's suddenly opened up, uh, unless you have space in your garage that I don't know about. So. Um, that's where we are um, with this right now. I want to just close by saying a couple things about trust. There's a kind of question of who do you trust? And there's no answer to this question because it depends on where you are and where you sit. Um, there's, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? So I have been struck. I understood that trust levels with the utility were low because of the steam generator situation. Mm -hmm. I was astonished by the low levels of trust in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's not universal, but there's enough segments of the community that don't think the government is doing its job properly that if I were at the NRC, I would be concerned about that. And I am frankly concerned that the NRC understands that, and so their reaction to this is to talk more but not necessarily to listen as much. And so that, I believe, is a work in progress where what should be technically relatively straightforward, which is the NRC oversight related to decommissioning, is actually more complex and has more wild cards in it than I had, would have originally expected four years ago. David, that's a, that's a really interesting um, observation. And, you know, actually, uh, when we were on the... When I was on the Blue Ribbon Commission, we were spending a lot of time discussing this question on trust. And I was thinking about the analogies with the Independent Safety Committee, which has no regulatory authority. And I think that there's a big burden on the NRC that ultimately they have the legal responsibility to make decisions and they have to do it within a very restricted framework on how they communicate and what they can do. And this, this leads me to believe that forming independent advisory panels that report to public officials or even to the company or whatever, but that 
that are not burdened by the responsibility or capability to actually make decisions, but are there just to provide advice uh, and to review is really important. And one of the, you know one of the examples I know you're aware of is the waste isolation pilot plant. You know they they had an independent scientific uh, advisory capability that was stood up. DOE paid for it. It ended up being housed inside the uh, state, uh, you know, the university system of the state. So that, that you know, and it had that kind of independence. And it, I think it make maybe maybe that is something that we should advise be done much more routinely. I, I, NRC could do a better job, but in some ways, as a regulator, you're constrained in in what you're able to do. Is that? that that's exactly my perception. What we find ourselves doing is filling in much of the transparency and engagement that you might expect NRC to do, but given NRC's statutory obligations, they're not capable they, they, of really they, doing. They have, they're, they're actually in a, in a very difficult situation <clears throat> with respect to proprietary, with respect to security-related information, and so, and moreover, with respect to protecting information about decisions which they're making before they actually make them. There's a whole set of constraints that they face. Exactly. And, and it, it just doesn't work well from the perspective of providing a conduit by which transparent information can be transferred to the public. Bob? I, I was just wanting to uh, focus on your perceptions of your own, right. your own panel. And I mean, I mentioned this five minutes ago. And the reason for that is because we have the advantage here. We don't have any authority. That frees us from Whole, what we just said. It frees us uh, from a whole lot of burden that enables us to do things without the burden of the authority, and which is a very positive thing. And obviously your panel doesn't have any authority, and the local panel here doesn't have any authority. That, that's an important attribute, but it's not enough. I mean, it's, it's of great benefit, but it's not enough. So I wonder whether you have any comments about, it's been now four years, about whether not that you've succeeded in engendering trust, but what the sort of, sort of situation is, and there are different sectors of the public yeah. that may have different views. Well, so I think it's an astute question. Our strategy has been, this is really channeling Tom Isaac, who's the chair of the expert panel, about kind of different ways that trust is built. Tom, uh, Tom Isaacs? I, I, yeah, he a, a chair, chairs the expert panel that was set up as part of the settlement. I know perfectly well. He's a, one of my good good friends. So, yeah. so he's um, and he's been in the community a lot lately and talking a lot about trust and about yes, the role yes. of this and so on. Good for him. Um, and I think that's been enormously enormously helpful. We we have spent in the panel an enormous amount of time listening. Um, and frankly, it's a frustration when we're setting up our meetings because there's so many briefings in the meetings and there's not as much time for listening and discussing. Um, we spent a lot of time listening and trying to understand different perspectives. And it led to the comments that I made at the top of our, uh, you know, an hour ago or whatever, um, about our approach to things. How have we done in terms of earning trust? There's going to be a segment of the community that's never going to trust anything we do. And I think, frankly, we'll never trust any institution to do anything. And I've resigned to that. Um, and I think lots of other people have resigned to that. I believe our job, which I think we've done reasonably well, is to listen often, understand, make sure that the discussion is technically grounded. Because the moment we drift off things being technically grounded, technically grounded but in English, the moment we drift off things that are technically grounded the mo is the moment that the discussions really become untethered from what's feasible um, and what's responsible and so on. And I think we've actually done that fairly well. I will say that from somebody watching this from the outside, this must seem like a real mess of a process. Like yeah. there are all kinds of groups yelling at each other. The press coverage is, you know, this group says that, the other group says that the first group is the Antichrist, and on and on and on. I think that's the nature of the politics, the way they've emerged around this plant and that community. I don't think it's unique to that, but maybe it's most, it's very particularly intense in that probably case. probably not very different here. Um, I, I think it's been very, very important for us to 
provide repeated forums for the people who don't agree with the technical decisions being made, for example, around the canisters, but that at the end of the day, we make it transparent what the technical basis is for the decision, and we make it transparent how the pros and cons then affect the community and ultimately community stewardship. And then it's up to the community to figure out which of those voices are extreme voices and will always be extreme voices and which of those voices are, are trying to make decisions to the best that they can that are informed technically and are also responsive to what the Yeah, so along those lines, I have an observation, and you can react to it, and maybe I'm off base. Um, there are members of the public in your area that, that can say to, person can say to himself, herself, um, one of those 18 people represents me, or at least I, I know how to call them, and they'll say, yeah. Maybe because I'm in a labor union and you've got one of them. Or maybe I, I live in this city and that's one of the city councilmen. Or maybe, you know, there's that quote, represents. And that's got to be a certain number. And to the extent that it's a very large number, that's more desirable than if it isn't very many. And you pointed out, and of course we saw uh, from the beginning, that you have a significant representative of, of really local officials, some of whom are elected and some of whom represent agencies. And uh, this panel here doesn't have much of that. Um, I, I, of course, this panel is also smaller. You, you've got 18, they've got, you know, they're just a dozen. Uh, actually, 11, I think, or a dozen. Um, I'm wondering whether you have any observations about whether that, that, that's an important or only just a, a, a side issue in terms of, of the overall trust? My view is actually central. My, my view is that <clears throat> there is a fraction of the public that's very focused on the San Onofre plant, a fraction that I believe is going down, but it's nonetheless not zero, yeah, but that there's a fraction of the public that's focused on the plant that doesn't believe when they look up at the panel of 18 that they've got somebody there. Okay. That the public officials are doing other things, that the people that are on our panel representing the environmental community aren't really representing them, whatever it is. So that's, I think, going to be the situation, um, and always the situation. But I think most people have that view, and I believe that's vital to the success of the panel. I think I just want to close. This is the last slide, and then I'm, I'm happy to take any other questions. I, I want to just flag. I've made a list here of lessons that I think we've learned. And Dan Stetson and Jerry Kern and um, others have been very helpful in fleshing this out. So it's a kind of never-ending list, a kind of evergreen list. I want to just flag a couple things that I think have been very, very important. One has been that we go out and engage experts in our meetings and in our special activities to try and keep the discussion grounded technically, but in English. Um, another thing that I think has been very important is that early on we did a few things that demonstrated that we were relevant, like this work on the canister yeah, yeah. Uh, decisions. Or the, ex um, the extreme events thing. That the you're extreme engaged. events. Well, let's see, that's still something we're, 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 we're working on here. Um, the work on seismic, enormously important. I think if a panel chugs along for a long time and has meetings and nobody comes and it's not quite clear what they're doing, that's going to be hard for people who are busy to sustain their interest in the activity. And those are the people you want to have involved in your panel, come to the meetings or on the panel itself and so on. So I do think it's very, very important. Certainly I, as chairman, I spend a lot of time thinking about, well, if we devote time to this, is it going to be relevant and is it going to demonstrate value? Are we going to see a way that Edison might change operational decisions or the public might think about something that's different? So that's a really, really important uh, 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 litmus test for the, the work that, that any panel like this, uh, like this does. Because at the end of the day, it's basically a volunteer activity. Even if you're paying people, it'll be basically a volunteer activity because the people you want to have involved are busy. And so you want them to devote, um, to devote their, their time to the, to the activity. Let me stop there and see if there are any other That's comments or uh, we, we want to have time for public uh, comments and interaction. Anybody else uh, on the committee or our consultants has a comment? 
Uh, hearing none, uh, well, thank you, but uh, you're, don't go away because the public's coming. Well, I'll, I'm just going to sit down. No, I'm no, listening. Yeah, 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 you get to sit down. Maybe you'll put me and back they, up here. And right? they don't get to ask you questions. They get to ask us questions, which we may then ask you. Well, I can say one thing is I've learned is that you know, even when the procedures don't allow a question to be asked, the questions find their way. So. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I mean, by the way, we, we're, we tend to be informal here. And many of our interlocutors are people who come often and whom we know, and so that, which is a good thing. Excellent. Well, it's so, very nice to be here. Yeah, uh, that, that was just very, very uh, helpful. Um, public, please.